The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It is clear that Ukraine is not a member of NATO, President Volodymyr Zelensky said last week. And yet, whether it wants to be or not, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is a factor in this conflict. Tonight, we'll assess NATO's place, past, present, and future in the war in Ukraine. Then we'll hear from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, representative to Canada, about the urgent need of millions displaced by the invasion. It's Monday, March 21st, and that's ahead on the agenda. Despite pleas to close the skies over Ukraine, the NATO alliance has so far stayed away from direct action there, even as Russia continues its brutal attack on the country. But that doesn't mean that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, isn't an interested party in what's going on now and in the future. And some argue a reason the invasion began in the first place. With us now for some perspective on all of that, and as is our custom here, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Colorado Springs, Colorado, with David Hendrickson. He's a professor emeritus of political science at Colorado College, specializing in American foreign policy and international affairs. In Middletown, Rhode Island, Tom Nichols, professor at the U.S. Naval War College and a contributing writer to The Atlantic. In our nation's capital, Paul Robinson, professor at the University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, specializing in Russia, international security and defense policy. And in Burlington, Ontario, Catherine Stoner, Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University and the author of Russia Resurrected, Its Power and Purpose in a New Global Order. And we're grateful to all four of you for joining us here on TVO tonight. Let us start by just stipulating off the top here. This is obviously Putin's war. It's illegal. He made the decision to launch it. He is being condemned virtually unanimously around the world for doing so. Having said that, is there an argument to be made here that the West provoked Russia in some way and shares some blame for the state of affairs today? Let's get all of you on the record on that, and then we'll dive deeper. Go ahead, Tom Nichols, start us off. Um, it's nonsense. The um, <clears throat> Putin um, has been attacking his neighbors uh, since um, 2008 when, in Georgia, 2014 in Crimea. Um, you know, the, the idea that NATO somehow provoked this is just silly. If anything, the North Atlantic uh, alliance has been going out of its way to try to not to antagonize Putin over the years. What's really bothering him is 40 million Ukrainians trying to practice democracy right on his doorstep. Um, he didn't like it in 2014. He doesn't like it now. Catherine Stoner, what say you? I emphatically agree uh, with Tom, um, and I think people who are making these arguments are basically mimicking the, the Kremlin narrative. There was not um, uh, an imminent offer on the table for Ukraine to join NATO. There wasn't in 2014, and, and as we're seeing, NATO isn't exactly coming to Ukraine's rescue now, and membership is not on the table. It's not, uh, it's not a process that can be done quickly. It has, on average, taken eight to 10 years. Uh, the last uh, countries on Russia's border to join NATO joined in 2004, and that was the Baltic Republics. And then I think if we can think of what Europe was like or would be like um, without NATO, uh, a military alliance, um, then we can think back to the situation before the end of the Second World War, rather than a Europe whole and free, which is what we've had. And I would just emphasize what Tom said in, in terms of what the real threat here is. The threat is of a democratic Western-facing country in Ukraine as a demonstration of what could be for Russians who are stuck in a personalistic autocracy under Vladimir Putin that has been increasingly grabbing their civil rights um, from them. David Henderson, your view on that question. Well, yes, I think we bear a tremendous amount of responsibility. Uh, we've made a whole series of decisions over the last 20 years, first to demand that, uh, or, or, or to put Ukraine's membership in NATO on the table. That represented a departure from the solution in the 1990s, which was neutrality. 
we sponsored the revolution in 2014, which was a really serious breach of, of international law and Ukraine's constitutional law, which had the effect of violating the electoral law and thereby handing power to extremists. It split the country. Uh, in the most recent episode, NATO expansion was a magic trick, a kind of now you see it, now you don't. To the Russians, yes, you are to understand this as a threat. To the Ukrainians, yes, you are to understand this as reassurance. To the American people, we don't want to get involved. Uh, well, that magic trick ended very badly in the current circumstance. And to say that we had nothing to do with it is to say that, well, it was inevitable. He was going to invade any, anyway. He, he's a monster and will do what monsters do, but I don't think that's a plausible reconstruction of what happened. Paul Robinson, your take. I think provoke is, is too strong a word. We, we didn't provoke Russia, but no decision is made um, absent of any context. And I think what is clear is that Western states, both individually and collectively over the past 20, 25 years, have, have taken a number of decisions which has created a very paranoid atmosphere in Moscow and, and created the conditions in which this seems to be a, a, a logical thing for them to do. And this, this dates back from uh, the, the war in Kosovo through the invasion of Iraq, bombing of Libya, NATO expansion, America's dismantlement of the Cold War arms control system, the Maidan revolution, and so on and so forth. Um, as for this democracy argument, I, I, I don't believe it because Russia has very good relations, for instance, with Armenia, which is a democracy, and in fact uh, bailed out Armenia in its recent uh, war against Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan, of course, is, is not a democracy. So you, you see in that case, actually, Russia coming to the aid of a democracy against the autocracy. So the idea of this is all about uh, democracy, I think, is, is, is a red herring. Okay, all our viewers and listeners now know where you four stand on this issue. So let's go for a second round here. And Tom, to that end, you heard quite a a litany there of uh, moments in history where, in the view of Professor Robinson, uh, NATO uh, could have done something that might have changed where we are today. Uh, has he persuaded you at all that something on that list uh, might be valuable? No. Uh, and in fact, uh, my initial inclination in the 1990s, I was a go slow on NATO expansion. Um, um, advocate. I did not want to have a particularly rapid expansion of NATO because I think the Western nations needed to have a deliberate uh, debate about admitting countries. Um, the person who really talked me out of that and who really convinced me uh, that NATO expansion was absolutely necessary was Vladimir Putin. Um, and when we talk about this paranoid atmosphere in Moscow, that's not the creation of the West. That's the creation of a man who is dedicated to holding on to power at all costs, of a paranoid mafia boss who governs by um, uh, governs as a dictator, keeps his inner circle uh, off balance with each other, surprised his own people with this absolutely insane. Uh, invasion of Ukraine, including some of his own military and security people, um, some of whom he now has under house arrest because they couldn't figure out how to do this. Um, the notion that somehow we've been provoking Russia over the years when, in fact, we reached out with the NATO-Russia Founding Act, with including Russia in the G8, with treating Russia as a peer power, um, trying to be respectful of their concerns. But that doesn't work when you're dealing with essentially a mafia don who has decided that he must stay in power at all costs. And part of the way he does that is by um, constantly sparking wars on his borders. And I'll just add one last thing. The, the red herring here is a discussion of Armenia. Armenia is not the Slavic heart of the former Russian empire. The Armenians can do a lot of things that Vladimir Putin doesn't care about. But, the, but Kiev and, and 40 million Slavs in between NATO and the Russian border is a different matter entirely. And I think it's really misleading to say, well, he, he helped out Armenia and there, but that, that is the Armenia-Azerbaijan situation has been a lot more complicated than that. Russia has been interfering there since the early 90s, keeping both of those countries basically um, uh, in conflict with each other while they put border guards and other quote unquote peacekeepers into those situations. So that, that's just a completely inappropriate analogy. Okay, Catherine, if provoking is too strong a word to be used as we consider this debate here, 
How about this? Was there a diplomatic avenue at some point over the last decade or more that NATO and or the West missed that might have changed the status quo today? I, I, I think I wouldn't say that we haven't made uh, some mistakes. And, and I think uh, withdrawing unilaterally from some of the arms control agreements uh, over the last several years was was one of those. However, the reason we did that was because Russia was clearly violating, um, in particular, the ABM Treaty and, and, well, and the INF Treaty too, frankly, with the kinds of weapons they were using. But I also want to correct the record here um, in, in terms of what some of uh, our colleagues have said. To say that the U.S. or the West sponsored the Maidan Revolution of 2014, well, of course, that's nonsense. And I just want to re reiterate <laughs> what Tom said there. You know, this perspective that we somehow have provoked um, Russia is uh, absurd. Uh, it gives no agency to the Ukrainians themselves. And this is Mr. Putin's paranoid global view. And it is a view uh, of the 19th century where great powers struggle against one another and the little peoples in between um, have no independent agency. And so hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets to protest uh, a corrupt incompetent government as they did in Ukraine beginning in the fall of 2013 and 2014 cannot possibly be genuine or spontaneous. It must be managed by other great powers. And this is, of course, ridiculous. Um, that's that's not the case. It's an insult to the Ukrainians who got out on the street and about 100 or so who were frankly shot dead on the advice of the Russian security services and a president backed by Russia um, and who now lives in Russia. So um, there's nothing that the U.S. did then or in 2004 to encourage color revolutions. That's absurd. Uh, look at the Ukrainians themselves now. Are those U.S. soldiers out there um, or Canadians who are who are holding back the Russians from invading their country unprovoked for no reason under a false pretense of some sort of genocide uh, going on in inside their own country in these two provinces. So that's ridiculous. Second, um, there is just to consider Armenia democracy or important in this uh, particular conflict is ridiculous. You, uh, Armenia is under under what circumstances is Armenia consolidated democracy? That's certainly news to most of us here. Um, there have been there have been moves in that direction, but Russia has also moved in quite quickly to basically control the Armenian economy, which is what it does, and that's the problem in Ukraine. Ukraine was getting out of control, country of 44 million people, turning what provoked Maidan in 2014 was, was the um, then president Yanukovych not wanting to sign an accession agreement to the European Union, not NATO, the European Union. That's an economic block, it's not a military block. And so the issue here is one of ideology. We can also imagine a counterfactual and this is where I'll end, um, where Mr. Putin is not president and Russia pursues its legitimate security interests a different way. And that is, in fact, what we did by forming the NATO-Russia Council. Um, and by, But we, we, we wouldn't give uh, uh, Russia uh, a veto on who joins NATO. And, and that's because of the NATO Founding Act, which has an open door policy. Notice, however, Ukraine is not a member of NATO, was not about to be a member of NATO, and that's the same with Georgia, too. And the last thing I'll point out is that in terms of sovereignty and security being respected, one thing that's completely left out by the realists in this narrative um, is that in 2004, uh, Boris, uh, pardon me, in 1994, Boris Yeltsin, Mr. Yelt Mr. Putin's predecessor as Russian president, signed a Budapest memorandum guaranteeing Ukraine sovereignty in exchange for the legacy nuclear weapons left there uh, when, upon the Soviet collapse. And that's the only agreement that has been violated here. Okay, you have taken us back to the 1990s, and I'd like to stay there with David Hendrickson for this next question, because the story goes that during... Uh, the George Bush, the father administration, his secretary of state, James Baker, said to Mikhail Gorbachev, don't worry, NATO won't move one inch eastward towards your country. This was allegedly a promise given and allegedly a promise broken. Do you think that, first of all, do you, do you buy the story? And second of all, is that part of the explanation for where we're at today? Uh, yeah, I think it is part of the explanation. I mean, we clearly broke our promise. I mean, to say that uh, we didn't get it, to, they didn't get it in writing, therefore it's invalid. Uh, and uh, of course, if circumstances change, we can change our mind. 
uh, you know, are not explanations that you would accept if you had been given bona fides by another party. I want to return to the Madon, though, the 2014 question, because that's absolutely crucial. Now, we had a challenge to our electoral law on January 6th, and every right-thinking person knew that that was a, a, a totally wrong thing to do. The electoral law is the most important question that constitutions answer, and it, it, the question is, who rules? Who holds power? Now, Tom and Catherine take the view that in a constitutional democracy, it's perfectly fine to do that. If the president makes a bad trade law, well, of course, the response is to gather 500,000 people in the capital city in a nation of 45 million people and change it and drive him out. That's what happened. Friends, if I can, let me get us back on the path here because we really want to we, we want to focus on on whether and again, we've we may agree that provoking is too strong a word, but w whether there were whether there were opportunities missed over the intervening decades between the end of communism and where we are today, in which NATO has to look in the mirror and say, hmm, had we done something differently at this point, maybe Russia would not have invaded. And I, I really want to explore that there. Uh, and to that end, okay, Paul Robinson, let me follow this up with you. Uh, you know, again, allegedly, the story goes that in 2008, NATO said to Ukrainian and or Georgian officials, Yes, at some point down the road, we would entertain the idea of you being in NATO. In hindsight, was that a mistake? Yeah, um, I mean, if we're talking about lost opportunities, I think it, it, it's important to um, particularly think about uh, the war in Donbass and how that could have been brought to an end. Uh, and this whole disaster, frankly, have, uh, would have been avoided. And, and, and Catherine made a, a good point about agency when she said that, you know, the, the protesters on Maidan were, were not, you know, acting on behalf of Western states, uh, they were their own agents. Um, though I, I would add that um, it would have been better had we not got involved. Our own foreign secretary, um, Mr. Baird, turned up on Maidan and gave support. Our embassy opened its doors to the protesters. I mean, imagine if Sergei Lavrov had turned up here in Ottawa during the truck protests and the uh, uh, Russian embassy down the street here had opened up its doors. We, we, we would have been outraged. Um, but beyond that, uh, they then started a war in, in Donbass. And again, taking this point about agency, there have been multiple um, academic surveys of what happened in 2014 during the so-called Russian Spring, uh, and also surveys by independent groups such as the International Crisis Group, who are, who are not pro-Russian in any way. And they have all made the same point, that this you know, anti-Maidan Russian Spring was very largely a bottom-up, spontaneous, process in which the people of Donbass themselves displayed their own agency. So this is an internal Ukrainian conflict. It's not just a Russian-Ukrainian conflict, but we in the West never, ever wanted to recognize that. And we supported the Ukrainian government when it waged war on its own people, when it shelled its own people for eight years, uh, killing uh, hundreds of civilians, incidentally, uh, in Donbass. And then in 2015, there were these so-called Minsk agreements. And the key point in the Minsk agreements was that there should be a special status, in other words, political autonomy for the Donetsk and Lugansk provinces. Now, Ukrainian government refused repeatedly to carry this out, despite having pledged to do this, it said it wouldn't. And indeed, in, in recent months, it made it very, very clear to everybody that it had absolutely no intention of doing this. This, despite the fact it was the only way the only way in practice of resolving this war peacefully. And the problem is that we in the West made no effort to use our leverage over Ukraine to persuade it to do what had to be done. Instead, we said to Ukraine, we support you, whatever you do. Here's money, here's weapons, here's military training, and if you don't carry out these, don't do this compromise, well, so what? And in that sense, we gave the Ukrainians absolutely no incentive to bring the war to um, an end through some sort of compromise. And in that way, I think we um, led to an ever worsening situation in which the Russian government decided there was no way out other than acting in this way. That doesn't justify uh, what they did, which was a, an enormous uh, overreaction, but still by pushing the Maidan revolution, which we did support, even if we didn't produce it, and by supporting the Ukrainian government in its war against Donbass, by not, um, inducing it to make peace, we have helped create the situation in which this war happened. 
Okay, Tom Nichols, I, I see you're shaking your head, so I, I'm going to give you a chance to follow I, up. I have to. I'm sorry, I have to bring this whole discussion somehow back to reality because, you know, David and Paul are talking about, um, you know, the poor Russians being just goaded into all of this by these terrible things that happened in Ukraine. And the big part that we're skipping first, and first, let me just say that I think David's comparison of January 6th to Maidan is um, atrocious. I mean, it is, you know, a 240 year old consolidated democracy as opposed to a country that is still trying to consolidate a democracy against a pro Russian stooge in, in their uh, in their presidential palace who's specifically trying on his own against the wishes, including of people in his own parliament, to uh, to join uh, uh, the European Union, which actually scares Putin more than NATO. I'll agree with Paul about one thing. NATO should never have said, OK, you know, Georgia and Ukraine, it's going to happen. It'll happen down the line. Um, the Russians have been dining out on that statement for 12 years. But we're talking about all of this as though these internal Ukrainian problems are somehow a reason to seize territory from a sovereign state. It's insane. Um, David has said, well, I'm, we're not justifying it. I'm sorry, gentlemen, you are both justifying it. You're talking about the war um, in 2014 breaking out as though it were some sort of force of nature, as opposed to a tantrum from Vladimir Putin, who seized uh, areas full of people that were going to be uh, sympathetic to his views, part de facto partitioning the country, and then saying to the Ukrainians, I will hold you responsible for uh, protecting your own country and your own sovereignty. This would be like saying to take David's completely inappropriate January 6th um, example, that would be like the Russians saying, well, there's trouble in, in um, Washington, so therefore we have the right to seize Texas. I mean, this is this is crazy. Yeah. Okay, let me and get David to. Letting, we're letting Putin. Uh, we're letting. We're, we're treating Putin as though he doesn't exist in all of this, and we're jumping right to uh, what happens after all of this territory has been seized, uh, and, and then basically blaming the victim here as if they have no right to defend themselves. David, let me get you to speak yeah, to yeah. Tom's argument about the notion that your comments could be interpreted as a justification for what's transpired. Yeah. Any criticism of American policy is ipso facto pro-Putin. So, you know, that's a way of shutting down all argument whatsoever. Uh, so true. Look, if we go back to 2014, uh, those people in the East uh, have a different identity from the people in the West in Ukraine. That's just a fact. Now, you can say all you want about the illegality of the secession of Crimea, but that's what the people in that territory wanted. And it's what the people in the Donbass wanted. That's not oh fake. God. That's not that, a result yes, that, of, yes, of, of Vladimir Putin stepping in. It's real. They don't want to be governed by Kiev. And, uh, you know, it's my view that a violation of the electoral law in any state uh, annuls the Constitution. If you break the Constitution and seize power, you can no longer appeal to it. And I've appealed in my writings to such honorable spokesmen as Daniel Webster to make out that point. I mean, my reasoning is based entirely upon the way in which constitutions were built in the American tradition. And if you violate it, you've annulled it. You can't appeal to it. You're in a state of nature in which political authority is up to the people to decide who they want to obey. The people in the East, you know, didn't want to obey the Kiev uh, authorities. That's just the way it is. Now, you know, the whole narrative in the West is that Ukraine is this united nation of 44 million people and everyone wants to uh, hate the Russians and uh, speak Ukrainian and go about their business. That's just an unreal description of what the country is. It was a cleft country, and it has been since the beginning. The only way to hold a country like that together is through compromise. Now, electoral machinery is the way in which compromises are affected. Uh, in a presidential election, and all the Ukrainian presidential elections were close, uh, you know, the dynamic is, is that if you want to win, there's a certain incentive to appeal to the middle. That's why we have constitutions. That's why we have the peaceful transfer of power. Okay, I let mean, me get Catherine and Tom. Just dismiss that. The let, me, let me get transfer of power. No. Can't have Thank that. you. Let me get Catherine Stoner. Agreement. 
you've got to gather a crowd in the city and overthrow the government. That's just illegitimate. We didn't we didn't cause that. We, we didn't bring those people out into the streets, but we did say this is a legitimate way to get rid of Yanukovych, as opposed to telling them, wait a year for the next presidential elections. That's how it's done in a democracy. And to say that this other method, this method of draw, getting a large crowd is the way to do it is just insane from the standpoint of any constitutional text. Okay, let me get Catherine Stoner in here for a second. And, and Catherine, I see you feverishly taking notes here, and uh, you're going to forgive me, but the one thing I don't want to do any more of is, is further interpretation of what either did or didn't happen in the Maidan eight years ago. Sure. We've had a great discussion about that already. What I, what I want to see if I can move us towards right here, and, and you know, from time to time, Canada does things that either help or don't help in this circumstance. And I want to refer you to a tweet that the former Minister of Defense, when the Conservatives were in power, Peter McKay, tweeted out. It was a, a picture of Putin, I guess it was a cartoon, of, of Putin looking at his reflection and seeing Hitler's image staring back at him. Um, he, I don't know. Weigh in on that if you would. Does that, um, is that helpful? Is that accurate? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think Mr. Putin particularly... Uh, cares um, what we think about him in the West and what, what comics are, are tweeted out or, or not. Um, he's convinced himself that this is, you know, the legacy he will leave the Russian people and the next generation of Russians, um, that, you know, the uniting or gathering of the lands. And by that, he means Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. Um, are you confident that that's all he wants? No, um, I actually think he thinks in a 19th century way and um, and the little peoples uh, of, uh, you know, Ukraine and the lands in between, as they're called, Russia and Europe um, are to be uh, split up and we're to have power blocks. And the problem is, of course, when we've had that in the past, uh, we've had wars. Um, and so it's it's not uh, it's it's not if we're talking about legitimacy a legitimate way um, to to lead Russia and and all of the gains of the last 30 years that Russia has made he's now squandering so this is also in many ways a tragedy for the Russian people um, not in the same way of course as the Ukrainians uh, who are who are literally being killed but to get back to some of the questions you asked about not one inch you know the the statement about expanding nato well i would refer our colleagues to an excellent book that just came out by mary sorati a, a, a historian of the cold war called not one inch um which uh, the nice thing is we can go to archives we don't have to argue over facts and in fact it was a statement made to gorbachev um to uh say what about if we did this to try and get nato uh, uh, try and get um the warsaw pact uh, out of east germany in particular um it was not a promise that was made and in fact we even have gorbachev on the record saying um that that's correct they did not make a promise to me of that it was uh, an analogy um so uh, it, gorbachev himself saying no promise was made and this is just something that that has been internal um, into the press and the media because of Putin repeating it again and again, which is what propagandists do, right? Forgetting, of course, that he signed, his predecessor signed the 1994 Budapest uh, Memorandum of Respecting Ukrainian Sovereignty. Also, you know, comment was made, so Lavrov showing up um, with the Canadian truckers wouldn't have been appropriate. So is it then more appropriate for the Russian military to show up uh, in defense of um, Ukrainians who purportedly want to leave Ukraine or, or renegotiate um, their their uh, federal system. Uh, no, it's not, right? Nor is it appropriate to arm them. Um, nor is it appropriate to hold a referendum in Crimea simply seized by Russia, um, where the only two choices in the referendum are, do you want to be part of Russia or do you want to be independent? So the third choice, do you want to still be part of Ukraine, wasn't even on the referen on the ballot. Um, and the referendum held in, in, in the middle of the seizure of power. In terms of um, supporting uh, democracy when countries ask for it, I, I'm sorry, I just don't think it's the wrong thing to do if, a, if uh, Ukraine wants self-determination. No, can nor can is I pick it up on that? Hang on, I'm gonna, Catherine, I'm going to pick up on that if I can, because uh, I've got mm -hmm. a graphic here that I want to bring up from Stephen Walt, 
uh, the foreign policy expert at Harvard, who had the following to say, and then we'll get some comments on that. He writes, Putin is not solely responsible for the ongoing crisis over Ukraine, and moral outrage over his actions or character is not a strategy. Unpleasant as it may be, the United States and its allies need to recognize that Ukraine's geopolitical alignment is a vital interest for Russia. One, it is willing to use force to defend, and this is not because Putin happens to be a ruthless autocrat with a nostalgic fondness for the old Soviet past. Great powers are never indifferent to the geostrategic forces arrayed on their borders, and Russia would care deeply about Ukraine's political alignment even if someone else were in charge. U.S. and European unwillingness to accept this basic reality is a major reason the world is in this mess today. Tom, discuss. This is the classic language of American realism, and Steve Walt is kind of the, along with John Mearsheimer, he's kind of the dean of American realists, where the world is full of these kind of, in, you know, largely indistinguishable billiard balls that roll around on a table and bump into each other, and that they have these kinds of interests that must always be expressed in the way that they're expressed uh, through power. <clears throat> What's missing from all of this is that these are real countries with real cultures run by real people. One of the things that's been missing, for example, both from Steve Walt's um, comment and from this discussion, is the uh, really malign influence here that nationalist Orthodox Church leaders have been playing in advising Putin here and basically convincing him, uh, as Catherine's been pointing out, that he is going to be the great Russian leader that will reunite orthodoxy. And I say this with a great deal of pain. I am an Orthodox believer. Um, I'm an Orthodox Christian. But this is a gigantic schism in the Orthodox world. And it's been something that's been driving Putin that realists like Walt and, and others don't want to talk about because they don't think culture matters. They don't think history matters. They think what matters is big powers jostling for advantage. Of course it's true. And, and only a fool would say that Russia could be indifferent to Ukraine and its security situation. But to somehow go from that to, and that's how you get Russia leveling apartment blocks and schools and nursing homes, is ridiculous. It's, it's a way of talking about this in a very clinical, detached way, as though Vladimir Putin isn't a real person who, who is doing these things for his own reasons. The, the, this is not... Um, this is not a war that's popular, as far as we can tell, in Russia. Um, this was a war that was launched initially by Putin talking about rescuing his brothers and sisters. I wanted to go back to one point. Catherine, I think, was trying to make that this the, these geopolitical arguments, if these were such strong arguments, Putin wouldn't be talking about Nazis. I mean, this is this is paranoid. Um, this is paranoid delusional talk. And we have to deal with the fact that this is what happens when you have power invested in one dictatorial leader who is, in fact, Steve Walt's wrong. He, Putin is, in fact, nostalgic for the old Soviet empire and has said so, and he intends to recover those lands. And I was one of the people, I just want to say this very quickly, I was one of the people who really, and David Hendrickson knows this because we talked about this many years ago, I was one of the people who resisted treating Putin this way. I actually thought there was a chance to get along with Russia and to, and to get along with Putin, and I resisted these kinds of Cold War metaphors. I was wrong. Putin has talked me out of it. He is what he seems to be, and we should be dealing with that reality instead of thinking again about all of these um, justifications, which are not, I'm sorry to say, David, these are not, doesn't mean that that, that accuses anyone of being pro-Putin. It means that it's basically always anti-NATO. And that doesn't make any sense. The de the facts on the ground at this moment in history do not support that argument. Okay, let me get Paul Robinson in here because I haven't heard from Paul in a while. And I want to make this analogy, and you tell me, Paul, if it makes any sense. Uh, I think we all remember back to our high school history classes and the Monroe Doctrine and anything that took place in the Western Hemisphere, the United States said, that's our interest, that's our sphere of influence. Don't monkey around in our backyard. Are we essentially seeing Russia expressing its own Monroe Doctrine right now in Eastern Europe? Well, to some degree, yes. I mean, I think uh, Stephen Ward is, is right, but, but, but state leaders do consider certain things to be vital interests. Whether they're right or wrong to, 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 to view it that way is another issue. And this doesn't have to divorce culture. In fact, this may be considered a vital interest precisely because of some perceived cultural link with the place in person. And it, it's very dangerous for you to, to, to poke your fingers into something which somebody else 
considers their vital interest, because if they consider it a vital interest, they will fight for it. And if it's only a secondary interest for you, you will not fight for it. And therefore, what you're doing is essentially saying, um, messing around, you're, 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 you're messing in somewhere where they're willing to fight and you're not. And that, it strikes me, is, is a rather dangerous and irresponsible thing to do. And I think, you know, it's, it's a lesson we need to think about when going forward in treating other powers such as China. And, and for instance, if you're talking about Taiwan or the South China Sea and so on. Uh, and bear in mind that, you know, they consider it rightly or wrongly a vital interest and they will fight for this, these places. And if you poke your nose into it, then um, you're, you're causing trouble. And I don't think that is should be equated with, you know, excusing or taking a pro-Kremlin line or, or anything like that. Uh, you know, one can uh, draw an analogy here with, say, um, crime. It, it, if when someone commits a crime, they are responsible. We hold them responsible. They have free will. Um, and that applies in this case, too. But any criminological policy which was based purely on the idea that crimes are caused because people are bad would be a very bad criminological policy, because we all know that crime has a sociological, eco uh, e economic, social context, which must be considered when you want to understand why things happen. And discussing the context and discussing the ways you may have contributed to that context is not excusing, it's not removing responsibility, it's getting a proper understanding of a situation so that you can avoid such problems in the future. And if we simply refuse to do that, then going forward, dealing particularly with China, we're going to run into this problem over again and cause ourselves a lot of trouble. All right, with just a couple of minutes left here, time has truly flown by. David Hendrickson, let me get you on this. Um, the the issue of opportunities missed by NATO notwithstanding, is there any doubt in your mind that Ukraine right now feels utterly betrayed by Russia, mortified by Russia, far more than whatever misgivings or, or concerns it's had about NATO missing opportunities? Well, you know, they feel betrayed by both sides. I mean, it's a different Equally? Theory. Both sides equally? Well, no, not equally, but... Listen to Zelensky. I mean, you know, he's furious. He His whole rhetoric for a year is, are you with us or not? And he received messages that, well, we're kind of with you, but no, not we're, we're really not with you. And I think that put them out on a limb. I want to make one more point, though. We have launched a total economic war against Russia. I see zero possibility of a political settlement. These sanctions are semi-permanent, if not eternal. That means a total recasting of international political economy, and it's going to be a tremendously wealth-destroying instrument. That's what these sanctions are. And it's a very dangerous situation. China is going to be brought into it. The whole world is going to be brought into it because there are no more neutrals, according to Washington. I don't think we've begun to think about the economic fallout from that, and we need to. I appreciate so much everybody being prepared to have this debate on TVO tonight. It was very civilized, considering the strength of the disagreement here. So thanks to David Hendrickson from Colorado College, Paul Robinson, University of Ottawa, Catherine Stoner, Stanford University, Tom Nichols, the U.S. Naval War College. It's been great having all of you on our program tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Fully 20% of Ukraine's 44 million people have been displaced as a result of the war. Millions have fled to neighboring countries and beyond. Rima Jamus is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees Representative to Canada. And she joins us now from the nation's capital for more. Rima, thanks for making time for us on TVO tonight. How are you doing? I'm well, Steve. Thank you very much for having me. Not at all. Please get comfortable for a moment because we want to put some background in place just to start off. And Sheldon, if you would, let's bring these graphics up and we'll give people the background they need to better understand this story. This is truly uh, a refugee crisis. More than 3.4 million refugees have fled Ukraine since Russia invaded in late February. Where are they going? Well, Poland has taken in more than 2 million refugees. That's more than 5% of their population. Romania, more than 535,000. Moldova, more than 365,000. Hungary, more than 312,000. And Slovakia, more than 250,000. 
75% of those arriving are women and children, as men, 18 to 60, can't leave and are engaged in the fight. More than a million could be displaced within their own country. The government of Canada, for its part, has promised to welcome a quote-unquote unlimited number of Ukrainians to Canada on a temporary basis. They'll be able to live and work here for up to three years, and the government has waived many requirements and fees. And just so people get a sense of the territory we're talking about here, let's bring up a map of Ukraine, and you'll better be able to see, and for those who are listening on podcast, we'll just describe that refugees are fleeing to the west, immediately west, that's Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and uh, Russians, of course, are attacking from the north, the south, and the east. And from the Department of a picture is certainly worth a thousand words. Earlier this month, Ukrainian refugees fleeing after a Russian airstrike in Irpin downed a bridge. And look at that. Look at that poor woman trying to escape the enormous challenges of her life right now. And Rima, with all of this now on the record, let me bring you in here. The last time I suspect we saw anything close to this was uh, 30 years ago in the Balkans as Yugoslavia was falling apart. I just wonder if you could compare what's happening today to that? Well, indeed, Steve, what we're seeing is massive displacement, uh, both within the borders of Ukraine, but also across borders into neighboring countries. You referenced a figure of over 3.4 million. We're now actually edging closer to 3.5 million, and I suspect by day's end we'll get there. Um, massive amounts. The the number as well in, in recent days, um, the proportion rather of women and children has now climbed to 90%. Uh, so we know they're leaving behind their fathers, their sons, uh, loved ones, and they're trying to seek refuge and safety across borders. Now, what we've seen as well, which is, is, is deeply troubling, is that the numbers of children who are showing up at these borders unaccompanied and separated from families has also been growing, which presents a whole other host of challenges because we know that during times of crisis like this, in an emergency situation, that's when the risks really soar for children and indeed women um, to be preyed on and become victims of gender-based violence, trafficking, um, exploitation and abuse. And, you know, just to speak for a moment about the, the capacity required on the part of the neighboring countries, which have commendably kept borders open and allowed people to flee uh, the violence and, and the insecurity, but it's stretching limits, uh, stretching resources rather to the absolute limit, and they need all the support that they can get right now. Can you just help us understand how a 10-year-old who is fleeing for his or her life by him or herself, how do they begin to survive? Well, thankfully, we now have um, at all border points, we have colleagues who specialize in dealing with precisely these kinds of scenarios, who immediately work with the authorities to register and identify these children, to try and put them in, in emergency foster care, link them to the national systems of the country to which they've fled, but also to undertake the immediate task of, of family tracing and trying to unify or reunify rather all of those children with, with family members or caregivers or guardians, whatever the case may be. So we have staff in place that are trained for exactly this kind of scenario. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up picture number four now. And uh, Rima, I'll ask you, since we've already heard uh, a huge percentage of the people fleeing are women and children right now, what are they able to take with them? Um, how, how does this work? Well, oftentimes, I mean, we all watch the, this this dramatic situation play out in real time. Uh, we were hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. And oftentimes, what you find in these situations is there's a just people are are, are completely hoping on to hope against hope, you know, hanging on to that hope rather, and it and and in disbelief that they may actually have to flee at a moment's notice. But often that's what happens. You you run with very little. Um, and the safety of your family is foremost uh, in your mind. What also concerns me now, Steve, is, is you, you have millions of people seeking, seeking refuge and safety across borders, but many millions more who are trapped within conflict-affected areas. We, at the moment, estimate that up to 13 million people are actually going to be in need of humanitarian assistance. Some of them more urgently than others. 
We're seeing chronic uh, now, I can call it chronic because we've been weeks into this situation, but also potentially fatal shortages of basic um, necessities of life like water, food, medicine. So the humanitarian needs in country are also mounting and that's, that's presenting a whole other host of concerns and challenges to all the humanitarian responders on the ground right now. Let's show a couple of more pictures here again to bring this story home. Sheldon, if we can, pictures uh, on page five. Uh, this is an elderly woman with her daughter who has found refuge in a Polish school, which has been turned, as we can see, into a kind of a makeshift shelter. And then, you know, people are coming forward. There are donations of clothes and shoes and toys. You know, Polish citizens have really stepped up. Uh, maybe you could speak to that, Rima. How generous have Ukraine's neighbors been to this a sea of humanity that has suddenly found itself uh, in their countries. Ukraine's neighbors, as I said, have have deserve uh, recognition for keeping those borders open and allowing people to continue to seek safety and refuge across borders. And and this is something I should point out, Steve, that is not unique to the situation being played out in Europe right now. It's something we see in refugee crises around the world. You know, people go where they can and and most of the times they're seeking safety and refuge across the border into a neighboring country. And, and they also remain in the neighboring countries because the goal is to ultimately return home. But you've seen a tremendous and profound outpouring of support from everyday, you know, ordinary citizens uh, in Europe, but also across the world. We've seen that play out here in Canada as well with individual Canadians and businesses stepping forward and, and contributing to the humanitarian relief efforts. And, and showing concrete expressions of that human solidarity that we need right now. We are not seeing, um, you know, in other refugee crises, you see camps, you see squalor, you see these kinds of things crop up to take care of the need. We're not seeing much of that right now. And I wonder if that's because uh, these refugees are being welcomed into people's homes. How much of that is happening? Well, indeed, we're seeing some of that, but we're also seeing that in these first mass movements of people, many of them will have family links or contacts in neighboring countries or further afield. And we also know that those who leave in the first waves tend to be the most able to do so and the, and the best resourced to be able to do, so, to do that. Um, Europe has also extended a form of temporary protection uh, to those fleeing Ukraine. It's, it's something that foresees a mass movement of this sort, which allows European countries to provide immediate legal status to those who are coming across the border so that they can ask, access essential services like education or health care and, and also not to be um, concerned about legal status in the country. So these kinds of measures are going to be the things that prevent what you describe, that kind of squalor and that camp type setting. Um, they're, they're well resourced and well equipped with support, of course, to be able to manage these flows. And so far, we're seeing that that's being done in a really, really positive way. How many colleagues do you have on the ground there? And do you know whether they are in any danger? We have a longstanding presence in the country, Steve, and in the region. Um, within Ukraine, we have at this point 115 colleagues who are on the ground from the UN Refugee Agency alongside many other UN agencies and, and humanitarian partners on the ground. These colleagues, uh, especially in the earliest moments, were like ordinary Ukrainians uh, sheltering underground and subjected to severe movement restrictions. And we have made the clear and unequivocal call that safe passage, there has to be a cessation of the violence. There has to be a silencing of the guns so that our colleagues can access the stockpiles of, of emergency items that we had pre-positioned in country and, you know, anticipating, unfortunately, that we might find ourselves in this point. But they also need to be able to reach the people who need those supplies right now the most. So our colleagues are, are there, they're staying and they're delivering, but of course at great risk um, to themselves as well. Have you lost anybody yet? No, thankfully, um, that hasn't happened yet. We know that humanitarians, un unfortunately, are targeted uh, around the world in similar situations, and that colleagues often do lose their lives in the line of duty, but thankfully, we, we haven't reached that point here. Good. You have heard the offer that Canada has made. Uh, they have um, foregone a lot of the 
um, restrictions that many new people of this country have to go through in order to attend to this crisis. Do you know whether many Ukrainians so far uh, are taking the government of Canada up on its offer? Well, so far we're seeing reports of people arriving in Canada. Um, I think we've we've well now exceeded uh, several thousand, some of whom predate the introduction of these uh, measures and, and were here beforehand um, and unable to return home. But these measures, uh, Steve, I have to say, any kind of relief that provides um, ordinary Ukrainians who are fleeing the violence and the persecution right now, whether across borders, as we said, or further afield to countries like Canada, these are welcome initiatives because that protection needs to be swift, it needs to be immediate, and it's exactly what we need in a moment like this. What else would you like to see the government of Canada put forward? Well, the government of Canada has generously supported uh, the humanitarian relief efforts. They did so early and, and quite swiftly. Um, what we need from the government of Canada is the same thing we've been asking for, for governments around the world to support us with. And that's to ensure that, you know, once, unfortunately, this situation, if there is no diplomatic solution um, and, and we don't see an end to this crisis soon and it becomes protracted, what we need is for people to stay the course, governments to, to provide sustained support. Because right now we have, uh, as I said earlier, profound expressions of solidarity and support from around the world. But as this situation drags on, and I certainly hope that's not going to be the fate of Ukraine or Ukrainians here, but if that does happen, we will need them to stay the course um, and to continue to provide that important uh, support to humanitarian actors on the ground. Rima, this is a bit of a tricky question, but I'd like you to weigh in anyway. And, and it's, let me put it this way. You know, on the one hand, you want to save people. You want people to be able to get out safely. You want them to be able to wait out this crisis somewhere and then potentially return after this thing is over. Uh, the reality is many people who will leave uh, are not going to come back. And, and, you know, the political question then becomes, are you giving Putin a kind of a victory by reducing the size of the population of Ukraine in this way. How, how do you make sense of that conundrum? Well, it's certainly something we, we think about with all refugee situations around the world. And it's no coincidence, Steve, that the overwhelming majority, something in the order of 86% of refugees who are fleeing violence and persecution, stay in neighboring countries. They stay close to home because that's where they want to return. Um, I have to hope that with the the unity of purpose and, and the action that has been taken on the part of the international community that we will see a diplomatic resolution to this problem and Ukrainians will be able to return to their country. But that requires a concerted effort on the part of the international community. And I think that that has to be the number one objective right now because humanitarian solutions uh, to these kinds of problems are not sustainable and they are not a substitute for meaningful political action. You know, it wasn't that long ago, maybe seven months ago, that this country was promising to help people leave Afghanistan safely. And I think the government promised uh, 40,000, that it would accommodate 40,000. And I gather fewer than 9,000 Afghans have now arrived. Uh, do you think we've forgotten about those people as we now focus our attention on Eastern Europe? Well, this is indeed a preoccupation for all of us at the moment, is that while the spotlight uh, is on, rightly on Ukraine because of the devastation and the trauma that they're living through right now, we can't forget that even before this crisis, we had 82 million people suffering the effects of forced displacement around the world. We have people who have seen misery uh, in the wake of conflict and persecution in, on just about every continent or, or corner of, of this planet. So we can't take our eyes off of them. And certainly Afghanistan is is one very real example. Just, just a few short months ago, Steve, we issued another call to the international community, we meaning the United Nations, asking for the single largest amount of humanitarian support we've ever, ever had to put out there for any country. And we said at that time that the scale of the ask on the part of the UN and, and humanitarian actors really reflected the scale of despair. And I'm, I'm really 
unfortunately in a position where I have to say the situation has only become more dire and more desperate. Um, over half of the population in Afghanistan relies on humanitarian aid to survive. And within the borders of Afghanistan, you have the highest levels of emergency food insecurity. That's just below full-fledged famine than any other country in the world right now. So it's important that while the spotlight remains on Ukraine, we cannot forget about the other emergencies that require sustained support and solidarity. Hmm. Rima, just in our last minute here, does the Human Rights Commission think that this is actually going to get worse before it gets better? Well, if, if you're referring to my agency, which is, is the, um, the Commission for, uh, for Refugees, for refugees yes. rather than Human Rights, we're all colleagues and certainly our, our work is, is very much linked. Um, if we're going to go based on the contingency planning and the forecast that we're working with based on what we're seeing on the ground, unfortunately, we will see the situation deteriorate even further if we don't have that kind of unified political action on the part of the international community to deal with the root causes of this crisis and find a meaningful solution. That's Rima Jamus, the UNHCR's representative to Canada. We are grateful for your time on TVO tonight, and naturally we wish you well in your efforts uh, to make some progress in this horrendous situation. Thank you so much, Rima. Thank you, Steve. the agenda for Monday, March 21st, 2022. A decade ago next Monday, a true Canadian trailblazer you may never have heard of died. Tomorrow, we'll revisit the substantial contributions of Ontario's first black MPP, Leonard Braithwaite. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.